Hey. Okay, chapter 32. Let's see what happens to Nell and her brothers. For an hour, the children rode across the immense plain of ice, chased by massive black hyenas. Drawn by the umbrella's warm light, they darted out of the darkness like phantoms and ran alongside, filling the air with their horrible lap yapping laughter. Their snapping jaws menaced the children, but their loping beasts kept the distance from the silverback, who charged forward in unnerving silence, red eyes ablaze, a trail of vapor escaping from his mouth. At the beginning of the ride, Nell had tried to talk to him to see if Badger <coughs> could hear her beneath the chrome skin. Yeah, I was wondering that too. More than anything, she wanted to hear her friend's gruff, reassuring voice. Badger, she whispered. Badger, can you hear me? The creature heard, but Badger did not. Badger was gone. Nell felt this fact like a punch to an already bruised and tender place. This was the way of the dreamlands. That much Nell knew, for she had learned the fir fact firsthand. Who they had been before was quickly forgotten, discarded. The silver wasn't Badger any more than she was. The silverback was what it was, and that was a silent and solitary creature on the border between good and evil. When a hyena got too close, the silver snapped its head, quick as a viper, and bit off its ear. Maybe it should have reassured Nell that they were riding on such a fearsome monster, but it did not. It only made her feel more, more alone and made the task ahead seem more difficult because Badger would not be there to guide them. The sky opened up and a hot hissing rain began to fall, leaving red splotches on the ice. It's raining blood, Speedy trembled as he watched the crimson splatter in the snow. Oh, that's gross. Just stay under the umbrella, Nell said. The storm passed, but as they got deeper into the wicked places, others replaced it. Fogs of bats, ghost gales, and a hail of flaming eyes. Yet through every tempest, the umbrella shone its warm light upon the Perkins children protecting them from now, from each new blast of dark magic and through each new storm, and all the while the silver never showed his steady pace. As night began to fall, they reached the base of the mountain. The storms had stopped. All was quiet, save for the electric cracks of energy that raced along the body of the plague dreamer. A silver stone gate marked the entrance to Vlazenkrak, and they passed through without trying to hide their arrival. Nell swung her umbrella overhead, closing it up with a thwack, readying herself for a fight. Nestled at the base of the mountain was a small town made of winding cobblestone streets and darkened gingerbread-style houses of gray stone. It was abandoned, the streets empty, the entire town silent, unpopulated except for a few sad old women who sat on the oversized black toadstools. They watched the silverback pass without knowing eyes, but said nothing. The main avenue ascended a winding mountain road that was muddy and deathly thin. And the higher the silver climbed, the louder and more frightening were the cackles of electricity in the sky above and the danker the smell all around. So you know the silver is the silverback, right? The half horse, half machine that's taking them up there. Don't look up, Nell warned. Not heeding, George and Speedy both did exactly that and felt fear like a frigid wind blown over them. Don't tell people not to look up if you don't want them to look up, George said. Nah, sorry, Nell replied, eyes scanning the streets for attackers, but soon she realized they were alone. This was just as unsettling. The silverback kept up a, quiet, a quick pace, his tires squealing on the very edge of the cliff. Many times Nell heard George gasp and speedy gulp, but no one spoke. Freezing winds pounded their bodies, and soon even the warmth of the umbrella could not protect them. The silverback came to a stop and communicated with Nell for the first and last time, nodding his head in the direction of the entrance. The message was clear. Nell, Speedy, and George were to enter, and he would stay outside. Silence fell upon the children. This was it. The end of the road. Here they would either save their mother and free Ravenhead, or they, along with all of the dreamlands, would be plunged into the endless nightmare. 
Listen to me, Nell said, as they all climbed off the horse-like creature, her chest tight, her hands sweaty. They wouldn't want to hear this, but she had to let her brothers know something. And listen good. If either one of you wants to stay and wait out here, you must. Don't worry about anything. Don't think about if it's right or wrong or anything else. The only thing that matters is we're safe. Something might happen in there. And whatever happens, I mean, if we don't make it out, I just want you to know that I'm sorry. Sorry, Speedy said. This was my fault. It was all my fault. I messed up. I could have caught the kite and pulled her down. Oh, all the way back to the beginning. If I hadn't ducked, this wouldn't have taken Mom. I got us into this, got us all into this. So what do you think? You think this is Nell's fault? And you'll get us out, George said, giving Nell a punch on her arm. You'll get us out. Not yet. But you will, right? Okay? That's what's going to happen, Nell, right? You're going to get us out? The boy who was hard to upset was furious. He would hear no more of it. End of story. You're going to get us out. But Nell tried to protest. Speedy shook his head and, taking the umbrella from Nell's hand, pointed to the gate. You heard the man, George said. End of story. Nell gave each of her brothers a quick hug and looked into the silverback's eyes a final time, waiting for Badger to shine through somehow, to give her some sign that he was there with her and understood all they now faced. The silverback did not respond but stared off across the cliff's edge, sniffing the wind and ignoring Nell and her brothers. Thank you, Nell said anyway. The creature had gotten them there safely, and right now that was enough. She turned and her brothers turned with her, and together they faced the ancient iron gates clad with gargoyles and stargazer lilies. No creatures were standing guard, so there was nothing to do now but walk through. Nell felt for the fearless traveler's guide in her pocket, and finding it secure, took the umbrella from her brother's hand and gave it a mighty thwack. A warm blue light shone down. There was nothing else to do now, so they moved forward. <coughs> As they passed through the gates, they found themselves in a large moon-swept meadow alight with swirling fireflies. Beyond the meadow was the castle, but it was hidden in a curtain of fog, which only added to the beauty of the field. Whoa, Speedy said, expressing the wonder they all felt. As they walked through the tall grass, the tiny flickers of amber light flew toward them in welcome. The delicate bugs zigged and zagged in looping circles around their heads. You bugs are in the wrong field, George said, swatting his arms. Don't you dare, Nell warm, feeling the need to protect the tiny creatures. Have you found my mother? A teeny spark of a voice called out. The sad voice stopped Nell in her tracks. Are you going to bring her back? Another voice murmured. It's the fireflies, Speedy said. They're talking. The tiny creatures began to land, coming to rest softly on the tips of cattails and hollyhock and other tall plants and flowers that lined the meadows. In no time a thousand pearls of flickering light had settled and lit up the entire field. She has red hair, a tiny voice squeaked. Nell bent down, expecting to see a small firefly. But instead, she beheld a child no larger than a June bug. It was a human girl who looked about six years old. Her miniature body was glowing brightly, but beneath the light she was wearing a nightgown and had the look of of total sadness. They're sleepers, Nell said to her brothers. A cloud took her, the girl whispered. She hasn't come back. Ooh. Mine too, said a little boy, sitting in the tip of the next plant. Soon all the fireflies began chattering, pleading, begging for help. Quiet, Nell said tenderly, trying to calm them. One at a time. She's in there, the little girl said. Where? Nell asked. A silent breeze fluttered through the field, and the fireflies were borne away. The gusts cleared the mist at the field's end, and Nell saw it was awaiting them all. Before them stood Dark Dawn, the ancestral home of the Dark Daughters. The
The castle was built in the shape of an enormous thundercloud and was made entirely of dark stained glass and sheets of enameled metal. All was in constant motion. Sheets of metal and flowing glass wrote upon each other in rumbles and screeches as ribbons of energy crackled and spiderweb bursts along the edges. Nell and her brothers crossed the remainder of the field in silence. Shh! Nell cautioned as they approached an unguarded door that led inside. With a whoosh, Nell closed her umbrella tight and readied it for fighting. They had yet to see anyone, but still caution was necessary. <clears throat> Noises meant people. People meant weapons. Behind the door, any type of nightmare could be waiting for them. Nell put her ear to the door and felt a vibration on her cheek. Beneath the metal, she heard another sound, the frightened chirps and squawks of thousands of imprisoned birds. Birds, Nell whispered. There are birds inside. Mom, Speedy and George said simultaneously. They raced to put their ears to the doors. The boys' collective weight swung the door open and both tumbled inside, Speedy landing on George. Nice going, George hissed, pushing his brother off of him. Real smooth. It was an accident. Oh, you're an accident. Nell quieted them and gazed around in disgust. They were hidden in the shadows of a vast warehouse with towering walls and a high ceiling. The cavernous space was filled with square metal bird cages that lined the high walls and were stacked in large mechanical towers. Thousands upon thousands of birds of every type were stuffed into cages that had nothing to do with their size. Giant birds were cramped into tiny cages, while scores of tiny birds were darting endlessly around in immense cages. Nell felt the meanness of it and felt sick to her stomach. This had all been done without the slightest care for the suffering creatures. The only thing that seemed to matter to the dark daughters was that their prisoners made no noise, for all their beaks had been bound shut with wire. Some twisted so tight that they were caked with dry blood. A few of the birds had broken the wires off, and from their bloody beaks came continuing cries of fear and pain. Overhead, a red light flipped on. A buzzer sounded, and the cages began to move, rumbling along a mechanical track. The cages rolled up the columns along the sides of the wall and out through the hole in the far end of the warehouse. Follow me, Nell said, walking quickly through the maze of stacks. She followed the conveyor belt across the ca cavernous room to the far wall, <clears throat> where beside the hole through which the cages disappeared, a door was cracked open. Nell put her eye to the crack and let out a gasp of fright. What is it? Speedy asked. Nell said nothing but slowly opened the door and showed her brothers what lay on the other side. Before them stretched a vast, sterile factory that went on for a thousand yards. Hundreds of slave workers sat in rows before the long conveyor belt that snaked through the room in neat aisles. Running along the edge of the conveyor belt were thin metal sinks of running water that Nell imagined was for drinking, but she did not see any cups. The slaves were human, animal, demon, and robot, and there were many human children among them. All wore dark uniforms and had the haunted expressions of imprisoned, alone, and confused, sentenced to a life in a place from which there was no escape, for even though they woke in their beds, every night they would return here again. Every slave was silent, staring blankly at the conveyor belt as if waiting for instruction. Each held a device shaped like a hammer, except that the top of the tool was not curved metal, but the head of a small bald demon. At the base of each device was a translucent tube. The tube ran up the, toward the ceiling and was connected to a glass tank the size of a blue whale that hung above the factory floor. A glowing liquid filled the tank, bathing the room in an eerie light the color of burning embers. A loud, hollow bell rang out, and the conveyor belt whirled to life. Nell felt a shiver of dread. She knew without a question that nothing good was made here. This was a terrible place, and they were about to witness something horrible. Badger had said the devil and Carrie would be thick, and now she knew what he meant. A low growl escaped her throat, and a few silver hairs sprouted on her arm. Her throat began to close up. Her breath quickened, and she could feel her teeth beginning to morph and sharpen. I am Nell Perkins she snarled, stamping her feet. Suddenly, Nell had the feeling that something had changed. A shift had occurred inside her, and now the slipping away, the uncontrolled change that had haunted 
her all her life was replaced by a feeling of control. I am Nell Perkins, she repeated confidently, not saying it out loud, but deep in her mind. And just like that, the wild animal tinglings vanished and her skin returned to normal. There was a second bell, louder and harsher. From out of a dark hole in the wall, birds in their antique cages began to appear one after the other on the conveyor belt. Startling swans, fish, finches, pigeons, jays, robins, egrets, herons, eagles, ospreys, warblers, on and on, each one more beautiful than the last. Unlike the birds of the crypt, these were familiar sizes, the regular birds of the earth. The poor creatures stood silent in their cages, and their eyes were filled with fright. With every slave working the line had a, had a bird before them, the conveyor belt stopped, and in unison the cages vanished with such speed that the birds could not react. In that instant, every worker brought down their hammer onto the bird's head. As the tools sped toward the unsuspecting birds, the little demons at the top opened their mouths and took a bite into the feathers. No noise escaped from their beaks, and no slave miss missed, but two things happened. Instantly, shafts of ember-colored light shot up from the top of each bird. Inside the column of light were the flickering ghostly frames of young women, their faces frightened and confused as if suddenly waking from a nightmare. It's all the mothers, Nell gasped, realizing that was happening. All the ones who'd been stolen from the world and turned into birds by the dark daughters. So many, Speedy said. The stolen mothers gazed around in confusion as if awoken from a dream. Some screamed, some cried, no one answered, and as quickly as they appeared, they disappeared. The mother's ghostly form sucked into the little demon's mouth on the top of the hammers, pulled up through the tubes, and emptied into the giant tank above. Inside the tank, the liquid burped and roiled with new influx of mothers. Terrified faces and desperately swimming forms swirled behind the glass, trying to escape. But from the depths below sprang whirling octopus arms that sped across their mouths, or lashed across their throats and dragged them down the murk, where they were not seen again. After a moment, the liquid became calm. The instant the ghosts left the birds, the spell was broken, and the birds were transformed into hollow china statues. Whack! The noise sounded in efficient and deadly unison as the slaves simultaneously brought their hammers down upon the hollow birds' ceramic heads, shattering them to dust. With cold sweeps of their hands, the slaves pushed the dust into the gutters of running water that lined the conveyor belts, and the shattered pieces were borne away. All three children felt a great pain in their hearts. They knew they had witnessed something truly evil, and fear, like freezing fingers, crawled over their skin. George, in a tiny voice choked with rage, said what they were all feeling. I hate these people. They're not people, Speedy spat. They're nightmares. Nell's mind was raising. Racing, her gaze returned to the great glowing tank of ember-colored liquid. A spiraling glass tube snaked up from out of the tank and disappeared into the hole in the ceiling. It was not certain that wherever the tube came out, they would find Ravenhead. It was certain. I'm sorry. She turned to her brother. George, do you think you could turn into a rat? I don't know. I never... I mean, it always just happens. You can do it. You can control it. Nell spoke quickly. It's the secret of all fearless travelers, she explained to her brothers, that they had to give over to it, but kept part of themselves holding on. Remember who you are, who you really are. Let the rat thoughts come and go, but keep remembering you are George, and you will be both a dream and a boy, together. Understand? George nodded and began to murmur, I am George, I am George, saying it until it became one word, a nonsense sound that made total sense as if he were unlocking a deep secret. His mind picked up the rhythm of the sound and he stopped speaking, letting it reverberate inside. You see that tube? Nell said, pointing to the glass tube that rose from the tank of glowing liquid floating overhead. Follow the tube and find out where it goes. That is where we will find Ravenhead. What about me? Speedy asked. You are going to help me smash this machine. As a bear, right? Nell nodded and turned to George. You ready? Yep. Good luck, buddy. Stop being so nice, George said. What am I supposed to be? Nell asked. An animal, George smiled and tried to say. I am George. A final time, but only got as far as I am before his whole body began to shiver and shrink. 
In an instant, a large rat stood before Nell and Speedy. The rat looked at them with his large, dark, glowing, knowing eyes, sure of who he was, and with a wiggle of his whispers, he winked and darted his head. Well, that was dark. Hope you guys are okay. You keep telling me you love this book. Um, but as we know, every time we go down into the depths of yuck, Nell gets braver and stronger and more light glows. So, we'll wait and see what the next chapter is. Chapter 33. We only have three small chapters left. Alright. Good night. I'll finish tomorrow.